Hello and welcome back to part two of lecture 18 on moral skepticism. In the first part of the video, we discussed Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, introduced who he is, uh, you know, kind of gave a little bit of background in terms of his upbringing and talked a little bit about his uh, academic works in general, uh, the time period, you know, that he's writing his, his works and so on, introduced another um, not nearly as well-known uh, German philosopher who came on the scene shortly before Nietzsche named Arthur Schopenhauer, this dude. So I did go get uh, the two-volume set I alluded to in the part one video. This is the world as will and representation. This is what set Nietzsche off on his philosophical journey. And uh, by the way, this is that obscure collection of essays by Schopenhauer that... I read that essay on suicide in that I alluded to. So we talked about Schopenhauer and his, um, you know, the numerous ways in which he influenced Nietzsche, um, but most notably, you know, his nihilist, his nihilism, his uh, this idea of resignation from life, and how that then f sort of fundamentally uh, ignites this uh, this project on the part of Nietzsche for really his philosophical project of then combating that sort of negativity, you might say, on the part of Schopenhauer regarding life. So we talked a lot about that. We juxtaposed right uh, Nietzsche's affirmation of life or life affirmation, embracing life in its entirety. We juxtaposed that then with the idea of nihilism, which you see shine through in Schopenhauer and his pessimism and his resigna resignation from life. But then also we talked about how you know Nietzsche would um, identify more mild versions of uh, nihilism as well, and basically anybody that you know we would refer to as religious, or anybody that subscribes to a uh, traditional moral theory, um, they're all going to be nihilists in this the sense in which Nietzsche talks about uh, nihilism. And you know we also talked about all the different ways that he's misunderstood. You know, and it's interesting or ironic in some sense that when people talk about nihilism, you know, for a good reason sometimes he is a moral nihilist after all when they think about nihilism or talk about nihilism the, one of the first people they associate with the the term is nietzsche but of course you know his entire philosophical project again is aimed at combating what he means by nihilism which as i tried to you know um, delineate in that first part video basically amounts to uh rejection of our earthly life right devaluing it in some sense uh, and we talked about then his labels, right? How he's going to label one who does that, right? Uh, has a mentality where they tend to behave that way, where they tend to devalue earthly life. That is one who Nietzsche will describe as a slave. And then one, conversely, who embraces, affirms life in its entirety. That will be one who Nietzsche labels as a master. Uh, so we've kind of laid all the groundwork for and then us diving into this in more detail here in the part two video. Uh, we did flesh out though, you know, a lot of his more general uh, musings, right? The idea of naturalism, uh, how we shouldn't take recourse, uh, have recourse to any, you know, supernatural appeals when explaining anything in our experience, right? because we have no evidence um, for such supernatural explanations. Um, we talked about his reductionism, right, and how that is in, implicitly at odds with the notion that there are any standards or truths uh, in an objective sense that apply all the time everywhere, which seems to implicitly undermine then the idea of morality itself, and we'll say more about that here in, in a little bit. And then we talked about the idea of will to power, right, his basic view of what it means to be alive, and how that's very similar to what Rand had to say, you know, left to our own devices, we would act just as the rest of nature does or, you know, all other living things. Namely, as Nietzsche would say, with this idea of will to power, we're going to do whatever we need to do to survive and flourish. And that oftentimes will entail exploiting, you know, our environment to include sometimes other living entities. That's just how nature works, Nietzsche would argue. So we, we flesh some of that out. And again, Nietzsche is all about honesty. Um, and of course, and break, um, ideally, he would he prefers this master mentality, okay? and we'll talk about you know how that's the case in some of what we say in this video. You know, this idea is we'll flesh out towards the end of this video.
that um, in terms of measuring our progress, he'll we'll see that he wants to suggest suggest we ought to cater to you know considerations of quality as opposed to quantity. We ought to focus on the higher individuals, the better amongst us, and making sure they are uplifted and they flourish and survive, you know, even if it's the extent, you know, of most of us, right, or quantity, right? So maybe less of us survive or we would survive uh, not as long, right? But at least we live an interesting life worth living, Nietzsche is going to argue. Um, but more on that, uh, obviously, as we, we move along. So speaking of this video, then, We'll flesh out, we'll dive in more detail into this distinction, right? We'll apply it to what we've been talking about in the course, more morality, you know, and how this, this fundamental difference in our existential attitude, whether we are life affirmers or life negators, how then that sort of underlies this distinction as it applies to then master and slave moral theories and what he has to say about morality. So that'll all become clear here. In a moment, and then we'll, you know, we'll establish the fact, obviously, in doing all this, that Nietzsche himself is going to be a master, which essentially amounts to one, with respect to morality, it amounts to one who does not have a moral lens, does not view things as though there is a proper way that we ought to behave, or that view of values as if there's a certain set of values that we all ought to subscribe to. Um, Rather, in being a master, you have moved beyond good and evil as. There goes Nietzsche. Down goes Nietzsche, as one of his better known works right, implores us to do. Move beyond good and evil. The master effectively does that. And so, since he's a master, right, he's a moral skeptic. And so we'll, we'll make that perfectly clear. And we'll end by, as I mentioned, talking about how we ought to judge progress. Talk about how... Again, how he's completely misunderstood oftentimes, uh, including, you know, this whole expression of God is dead and how he worries, right, about, you know, the possibility that slaves will become worse slaves, right? There's that spectrum. And we have mild nihilism, you know, all nihilism is bad, right? But we have milder forms and then we have the full-blown extreme nihilists like Schopenhauer where nothing about life seems redeeming. And again, Nietzsche's worried about that. We'll talk about that more. And then we'll, we'll talk about what our reading was about, this idea of, you know, historicity, our ability to become historical, as Nietzsche would say, contrasted with a, you know, a, a regular or different type of animal and most other animals, right, who are completely unhistorical, that are completely in the moment. And, uh, you know, I'll mention how I've alluded to in the first video and elsewhere that this wasn't necessarily my favorite selection from Nietzsche if you're going to talk about morality, right? But you do see all the things we've talked about kind of shining through in what he says in this in this passage. And uh, we can apply it and we will apply it to, you know, his thoughts in, about morality and his more general philosophy as well. Uh, and I'll try to break down as best I could kind of what I think he was up to in that passage, obviously. Um, and then also give you kind of a little brief criticism of that what he's up to in that passage um, so that's the game plan uh, i guess uh you know i'll end with uh, nietzsche then uh, i like to end nietzsche with nietzsche himself via his quotes some quotes from of his um you know kind of summarizing everything we've talked about uh, i think as i mentioned in the first video nietzsche is extremely quotable you know you probably maybe without knowing it you probably run into numerous nietzsche quotes yourself you know, maybe you've seen the God is dead quote. I have a vivid memory of actually uh, in my undergrad when I was going into my dorm, someone had, had uh, taped up on the, the door a sign that said, said this, God is dead. Whoops. Do I know how to write a D? God is dead. And then it had, you know, Nietzsche. And then it said, Nietzsche is dead dash god but anyway uh, i always found that kind of funny um you know maybe you've encountered some nietzsche quotes yourself you know god is dead like you know i i was actually familiar with nietzsche uh it, you know if i hadn't known that already i guess that in the you know on the yeah, paper it did say 
dash Nietzsche there, but maybe uh, you run across that you didn't necessarily know it was Nietzsche, but odds are you probably encountered many a Nietzsche quote in your day. Um, and so we'll let him do some talking at the end and um, kind of summarize everything that we've said in both the part one and part two videos. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into uh, this slave versus you know, master distinction. So I've already mentioned how Again, this is fundamentally a distinction with regard to our attitude towards life. And more generally, do we embrace life in its entirety, uh, including all the pain and suffering that might be implicit, no doubt is implicit in it, including the dangerousness it entails, the fact that we don't know, right? It, it is moment by moment. We never know what's coming next. We might lose it all in the next moment. That is life. That is reality. Right. Um, again, do we accept that, embrace it, do not deceive ourselves about that, right, and, and embrace it in its entirety? Okay, then we're life affirmers. Okay, so we say yes to life. Right. But on the other hand, right, if we don't, we're nihilists. Okay, so I guess I could begin by saying that, right? What we've been referring to as nihilism or nihilists, i.e., slaves. Okay, they are slaves. They're saying no to life to some extent. Okay, either in that more mild form that we've talked about, or in the full-blown extreme form, a la Schopenhauer, where nothing seems off the table, like you know, suicide. Um, again, life doesn't seem redeeming. And there doesn't seem life doesn't seem worth living at all. Right? Again, the strategy seemed to be you're best off just. You know, not investing yourself in what transpires, you know, investing yourself as little as possible in that. That way, when things don't go right, when you feel dissatisfied, inevitably, <clears throat> the experience won't be quite as bad as it might have otherwise been. Um, again, that's what it comes down for, to for Nietzsche. That's a sickly mentality, as we'll see, right, for Nietzsche. Um, that's, again, one of the defining feature, features for slaves, and that's indicative of them saying no to life, them being a nihilist. Um, uh, and by the way, so this is slide 10 of the lecture uh, lecture notes. So we're fleshing out kind of the slave mentality first, but again, it's kind of the, so slides 10 and 11 are me detailing the slave mentality, but then the following two slides, the master mentality, right, is basically saying the opposite, as we'll see. So slaves have a weak and diseased constitution, right? They're weak and diseased psychologically, me mentally, and I elaborated on that on that a bit in the first video as well. And again, given that their comfort, right, is they're, they're preoccupied with comfort. Right? They can't handle the truth of reality. Right? And so they basically, of course, this isn't, again, usually something that they're conscious of or that's explicit, but everything they do is driven by this subconscious most of the time desire to make render life as comfortable as possible as they you know barely endure and get by till the the relief that is the end that is death okay. um, it's that sense in which they're thought to be weak and diseased you know as illustrated again by the as he would say their highest value is comfort now to be clear the problem isn't that they value comfort okay it's okay to want a comfortable life you know that's fine to value the problem is that it's steering and dictating everything the slave does of course you know unbeknownst to them most of the time right it's the impetus for morality itself nietzsche would say for believing in beings that we can't see taste feel etc nietzsche would argue right god or you know the various um beliefs that are found in religion right? that's the the reason that's the source is because most of us can't handle reality as it is right we get bogged down by the fact that there's pain and suffering in life, that there is this element of danger implicit in every waking moment because we don't know what's going to happen. Okay. So most of us, right, as a result, as a psychological sort of tendency, okay, we implicitly try to make it, um, and it makes sense, right? Why not make things as comfortable as possible? But for Nietzsche, that's not indicative of a, strong healthy soul that can again just accept things for how they are right and live life accordingly right? and not have everything they do dictated oftentimes you know not not being aware of it right 
but dictated by their attempt to minimize the pain and suffering by way of making things more comfortable, okay? as is the case with traditional moral theories, where we're trying to get everybody on board with the idea that certain predictable ways of behaving are the proper ways of behaving. What do we do in effect if we're successful? If we get everybody on board, well, we render their behavior more predictable, and thus we reduce the danger in life. Okay? There's a reason why slave moral theories are popular, Nietzsche would say, why so many of us subscribe to them. Because insofar as they work, they really do get what we want. They make us, our lives more comfortable because they render other people's behavior more predictable. Right? Because they, we get them to believe that they ought not to steal our stuff or so on and so forth. Okay? Um, but of course, Nietzsche is going to argue that that comes with a, at a big cost. Right? And we'll elaborate on that in a moment when we go through, you know, with the master values. Okay? But, so we're getting kind of a sense, though, for the slave mentality and, of course, what underlies then all these slave moral theories, according to Nietzsche. Okay? It's this weak and diseased psychological constitution that then yields... Um, uh, a, a person that is constantly doing things catering to this. I want to reiterate, as I mentioned, you know, in the part one video, that that this um, distinction, right, the crux of the matter, it, again, comes down to our fundamental existential attitude towards life. It doesn't hinge on how much money we make, the color of our skin, the color of our eyes the color of our hair, thank goodness, right? Uh, whether you're a master, all it boils down to is, you know, whether or not you do this sort of stuff or whether or not you do this sort of stuff, okay? So, again, you can have, you know, you can have the life of a homeless individual and still be a master by all means from Nietzsche's account. Again, it's how do you, how do you tend, I would say, right, tend to view life as demonstrated through your you know expressed views and not you know not such explicit explicit views you know what sort of are you religious and so on so what behaviors do you engage in of course he would again the point being here he would say those are suggestive then of also what's going on with you with respect to you psychologically okay uh so let's get back over to this the good versus evil uh i get to this on the bottom of 10 when he talks about values from the perspective of the slave, he uses this contradistinction between good on the one hand and evil. And I think, you know, in part, it's just to be clear what perspective he's talking about when he's referencing values at different points in the discussion. All right, but, you know, good and evil. So how this from the slave mentality and how the slave characterizes values. That's you know one thing versus how the master is going to do it. Okay, that's going to be another. Um, right, so when when discussing values from the slave perspective, Nietzsche uses the, the terms or the labels good and evil. Right? And what does good mean? Basically, whatever's normal, right? because that's again makes things more predictable and makes things more comfortable because we have l less unexpected stuff happen. Okay, as I pointed out again on the bottom of slide 10 here, what's evil? All that's different, new, unexpected, most importantly, potentially dangerous. That's ultimately what gets rendered evil from this slavish mentality and the slave moral theories that are propagated by this slave mentality. Okay, that's what good and thus evil come to mean. Now, in general, right, these values the good ones and the evil ones are viewed through a moral lens, right? They're viewed as if there are certain ones that are proper to have, and there are certain ones that you ought not to have, ideally, right? Um, and that's not going to be the case then for the masters, right? There's no moral undertones when it comes to what the master values and how they view those values. They don't deceive themselves into thinking that there's cert something special about certain values they have and that there's something problematic then or wrong about others if they don't also subscribe to those certain values which actually then speaks to this point right the slave with respect to their values they're outwardly oriented there's this constant concern for others and what others value right and then are they valuing the right thing um i.e are they valuing things and doing things 
that won't pose a threat to us, right? That um, are comfortable for us. That will that will um, not diminish the comfort that we experience, more or less, right? So there's this constant with respect to the life that the slave lives and the values outward. This is supposed to say outwardly, right? There's this constant outward orientation towards the adoption, endorsement, however you want to put it, uh, and uh, um, of, the, of these various values, you know, this focus on others, right? where that, again, is going to be completely last, lacking when it comes to the master. So there's this attempt on the slave, slave's part, you know, maybe it's by way of propagating traditional moral theories to get others to come on board with the same values they have, to subscribe, right? to generate a uniformity in value. Um, why, again, to make things more comfortable. This, again, is indicative of their weak soul or their weak constitution, their inability to handle things otherwise. They have to go about things this way, Nietzsche argues. So generally, such attempts on the part of the slave, you know, being so outwardly oriented, um, uh, creating and promulgating these traditional moral theories, their attempts on their part, you know, whether explicitly or not, to diminish the pain and suffering, you know, the slaves are experiencing in their life as they eat by until the inevitable relief that is death for them. Again, so says Nietzsche. So they do all this, they cater this sort of thing, okay, cater to comfort when they could be instead doing things that would make things more interesting you know, create, create works of beauty that are, you know, again, uh, that make us marvel and that make things, you know, interesting and worth uh, waking up in the morning for. If everyone, if this wins out, the concern for Nietzsche is, you know, if they're successful in their outward orientation and their attempt to get everybody on board with thinking and doing the same thing, okay, more of us might live and for longer, but then what is that going to look like? You know, what sort of existence is that going to be? Is that a life worth living? You know, when everyone thinks and behaves the exact same way, everyone is just a copy of a copy of a copy, where no one seems to be doing anything significant, right? They're just boring, insignificant copies of one another, right? Insofar as they're all subscribing to the same theories and acting and believing the same ways and uh, so, so on. You get the idea, right? So... Uh, you do get this idea on the part of Nietzsche that, again, slaves create no, nothing new, nothing unique or interesting happens. In fact, as he says in the gay science, quote, whatever, what is new, however, is always evil to the herd. And by the way, the, the herd, sometimes you hear Nietzsche reference the herd. That's just slaves. It's a kind of derogatory way for him to refer to the slaves, the slave mentality, right? the herd, the masses of people who just go along with the norm because it is more comfortable. So, as I mentioned, this is on slide 11, in the middle of it. So, he takes someone like Socrates' moral theory okay, um, as a good example of what the slave aspires you know, to procure, right? What the slave mentality, what sort of uh, existence it yearns for, right? To consider that Socrates says things like, quote, so that we may all be friends and as nearly alike as possible, all steered by the same thing. This is exactly, you know, what Nietzsche would say is befitting of the slave mentality. This is what they want. Everyone to think and believe and do the same exact thing. Because, again, it means life won't be as dangerous. Okay? It will be more comfortable. But will it be as interesting? And that's Nietzsche's issue. So fear about the truth of existence. Okay. that it entails pain and suffering, that it is dangerous, so on and so forth, plagues this herd mentality. And so, again, the, these kinds of illusions, um, this, sort, this sort of process, this concern for everyone else, all of this is born out of this inability to handle reality as it actually is. Okay. So the herd seeks the contentment and sense of security evoked in its commitment to the good and to dogmatic idealistic beliefs in general, right? follow these moral theories, right? and in doing so, again, we really do render life more comfortable. Right? More of us do survive for longer. Right? 
So these beliefs do protect the herd from the dangers in life by imploring all to be obedient, to be good, and in essence to be normal and less dangerous, most importantly. So as Nietzsche famously suggests, fear is the mother of all morals. And again, this is for the slave mentality, for slave moral theories, that's the case, right? Fear, this concern for the pain and suffering, and conversely, you could the way you could phrase it is this preoccupation with comfort. It's the mother of all moral theories, slave moral theories. Okay. So turning to slide 12, you can basically just flip everything around for the master. Right? So master morality says yes, right? The, so as we'll see, master morality or master moral theory, there really isn't a moral theory then, but more on that in a moment, right? So the master says, as you know, an individual, the master mentality says yes to life in its entirety. Okay, it acknowledges, hey, some of life sucks. There's pain and suffering. Um, we don't know what's coming next, okay? but that's just how life is, right? The, the master is strong enough and healthy enough to handle that truth without needing to indulge, create, and, and then indulge in these various, you know, self-deceptions, Nietzsche would say, these various illusions. So, since that's the case, apply that to morality, which is a self-deception according to Nietzsche. Well, the master moves, as I mentioned before, beyond good and evil, right? They move beyond the tendency to view things in moral terms at all. Okay. So, a master doesn't attempt to persuade others to assimilate their thoughts. They're, they don't have that um, outward orientation okay, regarding their values. And there's not this constant concern with you know what their neighbors are valuing and whether that might might or might not pose a threat okay granted their neighbors might pose a threat right but they're not so preoccupied with the possible pain and suffering and dangerousness of life that it dictates everything they do right to such a degree in fact that they you know, are willing to deceive themselves psychologically right into thinking there are like moral truths or objective standards and so on and so forth. Okay. In fact, he's going to argue one who properly understands their value. They actually keep their way of doing things to themselves because they appreciate that that precisely is wherein true value lies, is in difference, uniqueness, right? Uh, there is no, so Nietzsche wants to argue, right? There is no, true value lies in being different. Um, that's what makes something appreciable to begin with. Okay. Uh, and so the master seems to recognize this. And I think maybe that didn't make a lot of sense, but um, the way he expresses it, so this is the bottom of slide 12, um, I think kind of helps, you know, portray what, he, what I mean there. So he says, quote, my judgment is my judgment. One must shed the bad taste of wanting to agree with many. Good is no longer good when one's neighbor mouths it. And how should there be a common good? The term contradicts itself. Whatever can be common always has little value. So the idea, again, true value lies in being different, um, you know, being recognizable in the first place, uh, and not just being a copy of a copy of a copy. Uh, you don't want to be, you don't want to be on board with everyone else and have everyone else on board with, you know what your way of looking at things and whatever it is you happen to value and so on and so forth um, so you get this idea that masters create their own values and right? they aren't just boring and insignificant copies of one another okay? uh, at this point in my face-to-face -face classes i always ask has anyone ever heard of alistair crowley and usually no one's heard of alistair crowley um, i'm surprised that i i don't even know how i initially got on to Alistair Crowley. I've got a few of his works. Um, but then I say, have you ever heard of Jimmy Page? And inevitably one or two, there are fewer and fewer hands, unfortunately, go up. But, you know, some of them will raise their hands and, you know, I'll explain, well, the reason, well, Jimmy Page, the guitarist for Led Zeppelin, I'll say then, anybody heard of Led Zeppelin? And then usually I get most hands up. And I'll say, Jimmy Page, guitarist of Led Zeppelin, big fan of Alistair Crowley. Of course, all of this is a huge, giant, long aside, um, you know, for me bringing it up in the first place. Why do I even mention Aleister Crowley? Because you might have heard of this phrase. So this comes out of his Diary of a Drug Fiend. Again, Aleister Crowley says, do what thou will shall be the whole of the law. And you might have heard of that, right? Again, that's Aleister Crowley, 
Jimmy Page, I don't know if I actually made the connection, but from Led Zeppelin, was a fan of Aleister Crowley, bought his old mansion and so on and so forth. Okay, but the only thing relevant here is this adage, right, that you find in one of Crowley's works where it's, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that, the reason I bring that up is that encapsulates sort of the master's perspective. There is no proper certain way you ought to behave, right, or certain values you ought to subscribe to. Do what thou will. That's the whole of the law. That's all there is to it. Do whatever you will. Okay. Now, of course, you know, why are people immediately, maybe James Rachel's, for example, why are they immediately sort of on edge about hearing that? Well, does that mean anything goes? Well, why can't Nietzsche or a moral skeptic, you know, say, hey, we acknowledge this, but then, you know, make Hobbesian sort of arguments for a contract, right? And conceding that it won't be in their interest. Right? Even though there's no proper way you ought to behave, it nevertheless isn't in my interest to do whatever I want, right? So, I mean, it doesn't mean, the point here, right, is that because one is a moral skeptic doesn't mean that one has to be, you know, for letting anything go, you know, just willy-nilly. Um, you know, it doesn't mean anarchy necessarily. Or uh, So it's one thing to, um, I guess, how would I put it? It's one thing to say something about whether or not there are moral truths or standards. It's another way, to, another thing to say something about how, you know, what's in our best interest in terms of behaving or acting in certain ways, right? I don't know. Hopefully that made some sense. Um, and so, I don't know. Maybe that's why am I, that's defending, because people, I think, you know, why am I defending moral skepticism? Because so, so many people, so many of us, right, are find that implicitly we're, we're so used to the opposite and, you know, we're, I guess, kind of, what would it entail to acknowledge there's no such thing as morality? You know, it, uh, um, does it entail, you know, a, a state of chaos? Um, you know, what is that necessarily implied? Um, and I guess I just wanted to caution us, um, for Nietzsche's sake, maybe that that doesn't necessarily have to follow. It's one thing to speak to, you know, the truth of moral standards the idea of moral standards in the first place and it's another thing to speak to what's you know pragmatic in terms of getting by in our everyday lives nonetheless whatever might be true in philosophy class right um, anyway so when discussing this is obviously implied earlier but when discussing values from the master's perspective okay, he uses the contradistinction good and bad so good from the master's perspective just indicates whatever they happen to value. I value a murderless society. I value vanilla ice cream. You don't? Okay. Right. Whatever they don't value, that's bad. You know, whatever they happen to not value, whatever they happen to not like. Uh, the, the point is there's no moral undertones. There's no suggestion that, hey, you don't value vanilla ice cream. There's something wrong with you. Right. There's no moral undertones at all for the, for the master or from the master's perspective. Um, obviously there's, you know, the, the idea is with respect to valuing vanilla ice cream, neither side is going to look at you strangely, right? But if you don't value a, a murderless society, well, this camp's going to suggest there's something wrong with you, whereas the master, again, isn't. Okay. Now I bring up Ayn Rand here at the bottom of slide 13, suggesting that, you know, hers is kind of most indicative of the master moral theory. And I, I guess I want to qualify that more <clears throat> than, than it might actually be in the uh, stated in the notes itself. I mean, she very she would not, technically speaking, you know, be a master from Nietzsche's perspective, although she comes very very close. Right? She still does seem to suggest there is such a thing as morality, a proper way to behave. It's just really weird because it's completely at odds with all, what all these other obviously slave moral theories suggest right? and sacrificing yourself she says there is the right way to behave but it's doing whatever you want so it's really weird because it's almost a master it's almost where Nietzsche is but she still seems to again cling on or hold on to that idea that there is a proper way to behave whereas Nietzsche wants to move All right he's past that so she's uh, ethical egoist, he's a moral skeptic. They're not quite in the same place. But, prefacing the point then at the bottom of slide 13, right? Of all the people we've talked about up to this point, Rand most 
epitomizes, uh, you know, a master. Or her moral theory would most epitomize, you know, the master's moral theory. Like I intimated earlier, though, for the masters, there really is not a moral theory, right? Because they move beyond morality altogether. Right? And hence, me putting moral theory there for Nietzsche's moral theory in quotes, right? Because it's not really a moral theory. What he offers us is really a, a critique of all moral theories. And okay? remember his you know, naturalistic account. So on the top of uh, slide 14, I just recall, right, that naturalistic account, it fundamentally is at odds in that reductionist account of reality. It's fundamentally at odds with the idea that there are these objective, fixed standard that apply all the time to begin with. Um, instead, there's just a constant struggle for power um, amidst all these competing life drives, Nietzsche would say. Okay? Some of which are going to win and some of which are going to lose, and that's just the fact of life. Okay? So all we do have in reality from Nietzsche's perspective and from the master's perspective are these subjective values. I value murderless society. I value vanilla ice cream. Okay? And the master doesn't deceive themselves about that. They don't take the moral step and try to objectify certain values, certain ways of behaving. Okay? Because in doing so, of course, by definition, then they become slaves. They don't do that. They don't take that moral step. They don't view things through that moral lens. Okay. That's that. Turning to slide 15. So I've kind of, uh, you know, hinted at this a few different times in you know, these two videos. Uh, so, you know, how would we judge progress? Are we making progress? Or what's even the right way to think of us progressing, succeeding, if you will? Um, well, that's going to look like two, you know, it's going to look like something completely different if you ask a slave versus a master like Nietzsche. Okay? And so, maybe I want to erase things now. <clears throat> so, I don't know that this is necessarily the best way to put it or couch it, but it's the way I've always done it, including in my dissertation um, when I discuss Nietzsche, because I discuss a similar point here. So, you know, what the slave's really after, I would put it in the terms of, you know, it's quantity. It emphasizes quantity. How, how do we assess if we're progressing or how well the human race is doing, so to speak? Well, how many of us are surviving and for how long? What's the average life expectancy and so on and so forth? Um, and again, so far as these traditional moral theories that are um, facilitated by slaves and, and so far as they succeed, you know, people do subscribe to them. Well, then we see this being catered to, right? People, because, you know, they don't do as many uh, unexpected, dangerous things, more people, you know, because they think don't steal from each other, don't hurt each other, because they buy on board, you know, they're on board with all that. We really do and might see, I should say, uh, you know, a, raise, a rise in our uh, life expectancy versus, you know, alternatives, let's say. So more more of a survive and for longer. I could have said that very simply. Uh, we, we see that, at least compared to the alternative, if a uh, non-slavish sort of mentality wins out. Right? We, we might see improvement here, okay? But at what cost? Again, Nietzsche is going to emphasize we lose in this sense. Okay? If this side wins, well, we lose here, okay? So the, the master, someone like Nietzsche, wants to emphasize the opposite. Okay? Don't worry about how many survive. In fact, be okay with acknowledging that people aren't equal and that we might have to, this is what really rubs a lot of people the wrong way. And you could see why maybe Hitler would take it and run with it, right? We might have to, how would you put it, um, elevate, I guess, uh, the higher beings, if you will, right? Or the, the masters, those that are most promising, Nietzsche would say, who will make things most interesting uh, that will render life most worth living. We ought to even, ought, did I say ought? Nietzsche, did Nietzsche say ought? Ought to elevate, do what we can to elevate, right, them, even if it entails maybe sacrificing uh, those who aren't, you know, of such a uh, character, you might say. 
Um, so far from treating everyone equally and insisting that everyone, you know, live for everyone together, live for as long as possible. Nietzsche actually seems to argue the opposite, right? That um, let's in fact sacrifice if, if necessary, if it'll help, right? Facilitate the lives of those who are better among us. So be it. That's how nature works, Nietzsche would say, right? That you just see this play out in nature. And uh, it sounds really cold and calculating as I put it here. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, the case where people die in order to, you know, but it's just in general, right? He wants to argue, why not instead cater to those? Why not instead cater to facilitating the lives of those who seem to be doing unique, interesting things, right? Who aren't doing the ordinary, average, everyday thing. Right. And who can thus make things more interesting, make life better in a qualitative sense, right? So if the master mentality, someone like Nietzsche wins out, the idea is, okay, given the alternative, maybe fewer of us live or, and or we live um, shorter lives. But the life we live is going to be worth, you know, it's going to be worth living more, let's say. Okay. So uh, hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, so insofar, this is how I put it at the bottom 15. Insofar as the herd prevails, okay, there is a real tangible security that gets fostered. But again, at what cost? So this is buttress, but then it's at the expense of this, Nietzsche would say. So while quantitatively... Humankind gains from such efforts. More of us survive for longer. Qualitatively, we lose. We lose some degree of distinction, some value, Nietzsche would say, right? Um, insofar as we insist on making everyone a copy of the copy, copy, right? We're making things qualitatively worse then. Okay? Uh, we're losing some degree of distinction. We could make things more interesting. So normality may yield numbers, but only distinction produces greatness, significance, and beauty. Okay, turning to slide 16. I've also hinted at this through a lot, throughout a lot of what's been said, but I wanted to talk a moment about this and kind of elaborate a little bit on this. And that, again, that spectrum of nihilism. We have extreme or versus more, you know, more mild, more mild versions. Right. So again, the idea is who's here? Someone like Schopenhauer, and you know, religious, all religious, you know, moral, it, it, all religious individuals, for the most part, from Nietzsche's perspective, are going to be at least here. You believe in morality, you're going to be at least here, right? So all nihilist ideas are somewhere on the spectrum, okay? But, right, there are some versions of nihilism that are worse than others. There are some nihilists who are worse than others, Nietzsche, you know, would argue. And so when he has Zarathustra famously, and thus spoke Zarathustra, to send down the mountain and, you know, speak of the marketplace to... The rabble, you know, the herd who just kind of laugh at him ultimately. You know, he shouts, God is dead and we've killed him. You know, what is he, first of all, what does he mean? He means that with the, uh, Nietzsche's kind of predicting that with the in continued influence, increase in the influence of science and logic and so on, again, Nietzsche arguing this, that. People in general won't be able to help but see through some of these deceptions. They won't be able, be able to help but see through their own self-deception with respect to God, right? And these religious illusions that they were formally able to hold because they didn't, you know, this scientific and logical way of thinking wasn't as ingrained in our everyday existence as it is nowadays. Um, before they were able to hold that, but now... Right. As time progresses, they're going to be less and less able to sort of kid themselves, if you will, until eventually they're not able to retain that any longer. But this is a problem for Nietzsche because, again, what gave rise to this in the first place? Their inability to deal with reality. So what happens when you take this life-preserving error, as he calls it, away, and you throw them back to square one, 
where they're confronted with an existence that they can't handle. They can't handle the truth, right? When you're hearing science and logic, right? We've killed God through our science and logic, through you know our increased emphasis on science and logic. Again, Nietzsche progressing what's going to happen for the great multitude of us. And you might argue that you see this borne out. At least it seems like fewer people are religious nowadays versus you know Nietzsche's day, for example. I'm not saying he's right or you know right or wrong, um, but so he's you know predicting this sort of thing happening, and you know the wor- then the wor- this is a worry. So you might think, uh, well Nietzsche he doesn't believe in God. You know he's great, great thing, right? Zarathustra doesn't believe in God, great thing. No, the worry is what's going to happen to all the slaves you know who are thrust back into this predicament they started with, and now they don't have recourse to at least this kind of illusion and so that's the worry and that's not oftentimes appreciated you know by people that come across this expression maybe it's not you know it's very very seldom um appreciated i think uh by the way i do take i've written on this with respect to nietzsche you know if nietzsche truly believes all this what is he himself doing you know if he thinks that most people can't handle reality what is he doing enlightening to them to that fact? Is he not hastening their own demise, especially in helping them see through their own illusions? Is he not doing this precisely himself? I mean, is he really actually even worried? Because he himself is seems to be doing the same thing as the science and logic is doing. Uh, and so I've, I'm, you know, I've written about this too. It seems, you know, how can, how can Nietzsche be consistent here? Um, is he truly worried about what's going to happen to all, you know, all the slaves out there, so to speak, um, when he himself is, again, seemingly shedding light on all the illusory nature of all their beliefs in his own writings. Okay. So, and, you know, given what he says, at least, it seems like there's this worry, though, you know, and Zarathustra is worried, what's going to happen when the slaves loses this life-preserving error, are they going to fall victim then to the full-blown version of nihilism and become a Schopenhauer, you know, preach life resignation, commit suicide, who knows, right? That's the ultimate upshot. That's the worry, right? What happens when we lose these self-deceptions that seem so necessary? So it's best to renounce, obviously, um, all forms of nihilism, but, you know, is that possible for the large bulk of humanity it doesn't seem like it. Um, so again, what do you do in Nietzsche? Okay, but he wants, you know, ideally, you to renounce all of this and just, you know, affirm life in its entirety. So this is the key, right? But are we capable of it? Okay. So. Now I want to turn my attention to, again, what I think is a a somewhat strange selection uh, from Nietzsche. Now, um, having said that, and having reread it again, you know, you can see the things we've talked about applied in, you know, this reading. And it is very interesting. I I think it's fascinating in its own right. And I don't, um, you know, I'm not upset that they included it. I just, you know, I wish they would also have included, I guess, maybe... The ideal for me would have been to at least include something else, you know, from like that was more directly um, addressing his, you know, moral his take on morality. But but let's go ahead and uh, say a little bit about this stuff on historicity that you see in that excerpt. So. What do we mean by this? Um, Our ability to be historical, right? So we live, remember Nietzsche's um, reductionist view that we talked about in part one, right? Of reality, right? All we actually have in reality that we can be certain of is the moment, now. And the rest of the animal kingdom, right, is unhistorical in that they, live entirely in that moment, right? 
They don't have this memory, okay, this capacity to reflect, to thus seemingly extract themselves from this moment and become historical, to, to not be entirely subsumed in the moment, but then have an eye towards right, the past and the future. And thus, most importantly, it, for him, it yields all sorts of problems, right? Because what ends up happening, unlike the rest of the animal kingdom, who are completely in the now, so to speak, in the moment, they're constantly doing what's best for themselves, what will further their own existence, their own survival, and their own flourishing. But this capacity to be historical opens up issues for us, right? We can, can become what he calls historical, the historical type, or the super super historical type. I forgot exactly how he coins that. Um, and both of them have issues, right? So we can be so subsumed in this, I, you know, what's happened in the past and, and sort of focused on what we want to transpire in the future that we're subsumed in, you know, this sort of historical perspective where we both are sort of living in the past and thinking about the past and it, and it sort of thrusts us in the future, right? But we have no recognition um, that really what moves us are, as he says, these unhistorical drives in the first place. You know, that we really have no control over things. Um, we think instead, because we're so historical, you know, as if we can control things and things can get better and that there will be a difference in the future as opposed to the past and so on and so forth, right? That's the type of mentality he means by the historical. We lose sight of the unhistorical, you know, the fact that, you know, in fact, in reality, each moment's no different than the next, and we have really no control, and each would argue, and there's this dangerousness and so on and so forth. The super historical, on the other hand, they have that recognition, and they recognize, as he says, the past is no different than the, few, than the, the moment now, and that there's a, how's he put it, um, uh, simultaneity i don't know how to how to put that there's no difference right that there there's no reason to expect that things will ever be different right that the past is the same as now okay um and so the issue there is that they kind of lose hope almost right they lose they're kind of deadened it's kind of leads to a stupor so they're you know they're wiser in some sense they have some sort of greater perspective nietzsche might say versus these guys right but but it kind of leaves, it's almost like uh, Schopenhauer's pessimism, though, right? It deadens them, and um, and it, it's not, no longer does it help aid them in what Nietzsche thinks really matters, living life, right? And so they're still, because they, you know, they see things as sort of superfluous, and, um, you know, um, they, 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 again, sort of lose sight of the moment and what really matters, and living passionately in the moment, right? So ideally, it seems, I mean, is the unhistorical, the ideal, I don't think, you know, being on par with like, an, an, you know, a, a swine or a cow as much as we can, is that ideal? I don't think Nietzsche, that's not Nietzsche's position, you know, and I think that comes out in what he says in our excerpt, right? The, you know, there is a line, we can use history, he says, um, but it's only helpful insofar as we use it for what matters, living now in the moment to prosper and flourish. Okay? And we don't kind of lose ourselves, right? As Rand would say, right? Um, you know, in these reflections on the past and so on and so forth. I mean, that's, that's again, kind of how, what I take him to be saying. Um, we lose sight again in this capacity to be historical, right? We lose sight of what really matters. But that's not to say that this ability to reflect, right, is that altogether bad? I don't know. No, I don't think so. You know, it clearly says so long as you're able to use it and immediately discard it, right? Um, completely, you know, discard it and let it go and, you know, use it for the moment then, right? Then it seems to be healthy or good on his account. But so many of us, the issue seems to be we, we, that's not what we do, right? We hold on to it and we end up living historically, right? We completely lose sight of the moment altogether, okay? That's the upshot. Now, on slide 18, 
I kind of give a brief criticism, critique, I should say, of this take, right? He wants to sort of, it seems like, distinguish um, as if there's a fuller sense of living, right? If, you know, living completely in the moment, which is like, in some sense, being less reflective, living a less intellectual life, but that's somehow living a more full or in the moment life. But I don't know, especially someone, so my, I guess my critique would be how someone who's a materialist or a naturalist, I should say, who explains everything in purely natural terms, you know, how they can make such a distinction is it wouldn't reflection and intelligence still be just as much, you know, living in the moment, living since it's an entirely natural process? I mean, why does he want to suggest that being this way is in fact so much worse than one who is completely unhistorical. I mean, on what basis are you even making that sort of judgment, I guess? Um, given that you're, again, a, a naturalist in the first place, isn't everything equally a reflection of nature living? I, I, I don't know if I put that point very well, but um, again, that's the what I'm trying to draw out on slide 18. So as I've mentioned, I think that's it for now. Um, for now, I guess it's for the whole course, it's pretty much it. I turn now to conclude, as I've suggested I will a few times, conclude this Nietzsche lecture by letting Nietzsche himself talk. Um, so again, Nietzsche, very quotable. Uh, and all these quotes, I think, do a great job of sort of, again, capturing all the points we've raised up to this point, you know capturing his more general points, but then also a specific issue then um, with respect to these typical moral theories that we've talked about all, all uh, throughout the course and to the idea of morality in general. Okay. So without further ado, bear with me as I read through these. Now, I think I actually lie on the top of slide 19. I suggest all these are from Beyond Good and Evil, but I know for a fact that one of these it is the one on top of slide 20 is actually from i have a book over here on uh, with his letters that he wrote to various correspondents throughout his life and that one's from a letter he had to his sister um, but i think all the other ones are from beyond good and evil so he writes quote there are no moral phenomena at all but only a moral interpretation of phenomena arguably the most famous of his morality quotes again there are no more moral phenomena at all no such thing as morality okay. but only a moral interpretation of phenomena only moral theories okay. quote indeed it might be a basic characteristic of existence that those who would know it completely would perish so none of us can handle the truth in which case the strength of a spirit should be measured according to how much of the truth one could still barely endure or to put it more clearly to what degree one would require it to be thinned down, shrouded, sweetened, blunted, falsified. So he's saying, hey, it might be the case that none of us can handle reality. And so really the strength of a spirit, how do we measure the strength of character and how much self-deception they have to indulge in, right? The strongest among us have to indulge the least in the self-deception. Maybe it's the case that we all have to, right? But the strongest among us will resist this urge and do it the least. Quote, perhaps nobody yet has been truthful enough about what truthfulness is. End quote. Okay. Top of 20. This is the one to his sister. And I think it's the one, I, did I allude to this? Was this, this might have been the first part. You know, the whole idea of ignorance is bliss. Do we have two competing paths here? Oh boy. Right. Or maybe this is the false dilemma. Who knows? Okay. But Nietzsche, I alluded to this quote, right? Nietzsche seems to suggest through things like this that, you know, there might be something to this idea. Okay. And in which case, you know, uh, maybe I should have mentioned this at the beginning before you took an entire course in philosophy, right? Which is presumably helping us, right, down this path, right? Maybe I should have warned you if what you really, if this is all true, if what you really cared about is this. Don't take the course. So he writes to his sister, quote, Every true faith is indeed infallible. It performs what the believing person hopes to find in it, but it does not offer the least support for the establishing of an objective truth. 
Hear the ways of men divide. If you want to achieve peace of mind and happiness, then have faith. If you want to be a disciple of truth, then search. End quote. And then we'll end with the one most applicable to the issue of morality itself. Is there such a thing as morality in the first place? Never mind what the proper moral theory is, which we busied ourselves with the entire course. Let's back up. Is there such a thing as morality itself? He writes, quote, in all sciences of morals, you know, ethical philosophy, all these moral philosophers and what they're up to. Quote, in all sciences of morals, so far one thing was lacking, strange as it may sound, the problem of morality itself. What was lacking was any suspicion that there was something problematic here. What the philosophers called a rational foundation for morality and tried to supply was, seen in the right light, merely a scholar, scholarly variation of the common faith in the prevalent morality. A new means of expression for this faith, certainly the very opposite of an examination, analysis, questioning, and vivisection of this very faith. In other words, all these prior moral theorists, with the exception maybe Ayn Rand, you know, none of them actually question morality itself. Rather, they just took what they were, some might already conditioned to, to think and believe, and try to offer a rational justification for it, right? They wrote ethical philosophy books in defense of that popular, common, everyday view of morality, right, that they grew into. But they never actually questioned morality itself, which, of course, Nietzsche thinks is what he does, which is why he arrives at moral skepticism and the idea that there is nothing to it, no such thing as morality. And with that, I leave you. That's the end of our ethics course. I'll leave you with our reflection time questions. I, I will post another um, video, just a short video to wrap up um, with some concluding remarks about the course in general and grading the uh, final quiz and, and so on. So I'll post that, but we'll end this, um, this lecture then by bringing us full circle. You might recall in the initial reflection time questions for lecture one, I asked you to assess the degree to which you, you know, used moral terms, the degree to which you reflected on them, and so on. So here I ask you to now, having gone through all these various justifications for using these terms and so on, and then, you know, also getting Nietzsche's take, um, you know, is there a such thing as morality? Okay, that's the question one here. Right. Is there no such thing as morality? And if that's the case, if Nietzsche's right, if that's ultimately where you end up, going back full circle then to you know, the, the questions in lecture one, are you prepared to stop saying things like, she's so, Sally's so wrong to do, to do that, you know, how could she? Um, or are you going to still nevertheless say she's wrong, even though you can see there's no reason to, um, right? We have to, you know, if we give Nietzsche his position, then, and this is Rachel's worry, presumably, right? You, you better not, if you're going to be consistent, you better not keep saying things like that. Better not be making these moral judgments, okay? or you at least shouldn't be if you are consistent. And what about so? Question two then is, you know, what do you make of that notion of kind of changing the way so many of us tend to think of um, progress, right? And measuring success and progress in terms of how interesting life is or the quality of our life, and focusing on that rather than focusing on, as he would say, slaves do, right? ensuring we won't live as long as possible, right? The, as many as possible of us live for as long as possible. So what do you think about um, that juxtaposition in terms of what matters most? And that's it. Like I said, I'll, um, for those of you taking the course, I'll you know post a, a video to, um, to wrap up the course and give a few concluding remarks. Um, again, hold back the tears. I know it's going to be tough not having another lecture to look forward to, right? Um, please. Uh, but I will see, say, actually, I'll speak to, you know, for example, uh, in that concluding video, I'll talk about if you are interested, if you did find some of this um, interesting, what you can do as a next step, you know, some other classes uh, or on your own, you know, what you can do. So with that, though, we'll go ahead and end our lecture 18 on our part two video, the lecture 18 on moral skepticism. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.